I thank the House. I just want to make a few brief remarks to you all while you're here. Just over uh, six years and three months ago, I had the honour of being elected the 30th Speaker of this House of Representatives. As you know from my announcement when we last sat, today will be my last day in the chair before I rejoin you on the floor as the government member for Casey. As such, my statement today here from the Speaker's chair is not a valedictory. I'll do that separately from the floor of the House in the parliamentary months ahead. For this reason, I'll confine my remarks today to thanking a number of people here in Parliament House who have performed critical roles during my speakership. Without them and their great support and advice, I couldn't have done the job that I've done. I thank the former clerk, David Elder, who was there when I was first elected in sudden and unexpected circumstances, and for everything else that followed, from lost votes to tied votes, leading to casting votes, to the by-elections due to section 44 of the Constitution, including, as many of you would recall, a record five on one day. <laughs> I thank the clerk, Clarissa Surtees, who's worked with me the entire time of my speakership. I thank her for her equally wise counsel. She has led a hardworking and dedicated team that's ensured that this House of Representatives kept sitting during this pandemic for you and through you for the Australian people. Can I thank all of the House staff, including the sergeant, the deputy clerk, the attendants who have worked directly with me and my office. I thank the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition for their friendship and support. I think it's helped the House that we've known each other a long time. In the case of the Prime Minister, we became great mates when I was first running for election in 2001, and we can both now reveal when I wanted some alternative campaigning advice from him, because I didn't quite trust some of the advice I was getting. You know how nervous candidates get. <laughs> in the case of the Leader of the Opposition, we met shortly after that election. For memory, it started with him saying he thought the only thing we had in common was the fact that we were both named Anthony, but we built a strong friendship from there. I thank the Treasurer for his long-standing friendship from our time as advisers and now as colleagues and, as always, as he reminds you regularly, as Carlton supporters. I can tell you he is as loud at the football as he is here, but unfortunately I'm powerless to do anything about that. <laughs> can I also say I simply don't have another friend on the planet who texts or apps me so frequently. <laughs> the <laughs> Sounds like you're contesting it. <laughs> the Deputy Leader of the Opposition has known me for 35 years. We've always been opponents, but we've always been mates. Can I say to all of you, being a friend with someone who holds a different political view does not mean you dilute your views or your values. Can I thank the Leader of the House, who I have worked closely with in recent months and who I've been a friend and colleague with for 20 years? I want to thank my friend, the Manager of Opposition Business, who I've also worked closely with for the benefit of the House through my entire speakership. He's been the one constant over the six years and three months. We got to know each other really well and worked on a basis of trust. And I want to thank him for the role he played in ensuring the cooperation and the procedures and processes uh, that were helped put in place the bipartisan nature uh, to ensure that we were able to keep sitting through COVID. I thank the Deputy Speaker. I thank the former Deputy Speakers. Uh, I work closely with you all. I want to thank the Whips, uh, Bert and Chris uh, and your teams for all the work you've done during this difficult and trying period uh, with the COVID pandemic. I thank former presidents of the Senate, Parry and Ryan. Both are great friends, and in the case of the latter, for more than 25 years. 
I thank the President of the Senate, Slade Brockman, who has been President, of course, only for a few weeks. And I also thank the Department of Parliamentary Services, led by Rob Stefanik, with whom I've worked very closely uh, the entire time of my speakership. The department has overseen massive building and security upgrades and embarked on a range of necessary reforms. Of course, I want to thank all my Liberal Party colleagues here in the House for their support in nominating me for this role, and particularly to the Prime Minister, who supported me so strongly when I first put up my hand. Finally, I thank my own staff, led by the incredible Kate Clooney's Ross. We met many years ago and worked together in the Howard government. When I appointed her my chief of staff, I told her I wanted her to be frank and blunt with me about my performance and approach. She did not ponder this. She's never wavered, and that's been to my benefit and, can I say, to the benefit of the House. Kate, over those six years and three months, has fostered a magnificent speaker's office team. Uh, you'd appreciate many staff over that period of time. But I just want to mention some long-standing advisers, uh, Claudine Wedgwood-Gills, Stuart Woodley, Belinda McInnes and Raymond Knight. I knew that Kate could be as impartial as I wanted to be and have sought to be, and she has. She and my office have worked closely with all members, both sides of the House. Can I say it might surprise you that Kate and all of the staff have also dealt with some very difficult people in this building at times, including some in this House, but always with great professionalism. Colleagues, I've at all times sought to operate fairly, consistently and predictably. Of course, today is my last sitting day. Tomorrow morning, uh, I will visit the Governor-General to tender my resignation first thing in the morning. Thank you. See you on the floor tomorrow. Prime Minister. Speaker, I know you don't want us to make a fuss, and so I'll seek to respect that wish, as I'm sure others will. You are the longest serving Speaker of my generation, and I suspect we have seen the finest Speaker that this Parliament has had the great opportunity to witness in action. That may be a contested proposition. I suspect it will, but it's certainly my view. Mm -hmm. Mr Speaker, you have demonstrated that any member in this place can make a difference, and you have sought through your carriage of that important chair everything you've been able to do to facilitate members to make that contribution. We all come here with hopes and aspirations. We all come here full of energy and belief and ambition for the things that we want to achieve for our country. And in this place, there is an opportunity to give expression to that, both in what we say in this place, but also how we act and vote in this place. And you have ensured at all times, as you said you would, to give a fair go to all on the floor of this chamber. That's what you said when you were first coming into this role in August of 2000. And 15, you said, I'll bring to this place, to the best of my ability, a better parliament. And I believe you've achieved that. And I could not be prouder. <laughs> As one of those, together um, with Christopher Pine many years ago and many others, who I'm sure would join me in saying, I think we got that one absolutely right in coming together and, and supporting your candidacy in the way that occurred and that was so well supported across. Um, the government party room, Mr Speaker, and, uh, and ultimately, as, as history has gone on to prove, you are the only Speaker other than Mr Speaker Sir Frederick Holder, who was elected unopposed three times in a row. And this happened, Mr Speaker, uh, the last time that happened was 1909. 
And I think that says a lot, Mr Speaker, about the way you've carried yourself in this place. It says a lot about your meticulous attention to detail. It says a lot about your understanding of the motivations and good faith that is brought, I believe, into this chamber each day as we each come in here and, and seek to discharge our duties as, as we best see fit. And you've been a great servant and enabler of that. And you've understood that role. This has not been a place from which you've sought to look down on this chamber and, and lord it over this chamber. But you've, you've engaged with this chamber as, as one, of, one of equals, coming here with all the same motivations and seeking to ensure that other members of this place could realise what you've always hoped to achieve in your own presence here and why you very first put your hand up um, to be a member of this place. And so, on behalf of all the members here, I want to thank you for that. I want to thank you for the way you saw the role and that you engaged the role and that you engaged with all of us in enabling that to be the outcome. And I believe that's why you've been so successful. And that's why you've earned the respect of not just the people in this chamber, um, but those who look, look on on this chamber. Um, they've seen you in many ways as, as their advocate, I think, in this place and that you are acting on their behalf to ensure this chamber operates in the way that they would hope it would. And so, while one of us, you've also been one with them, I think, over that period of time uh, that you have been Speaker. And so I want to thank you for that. I also want to thank you, and through you, all of those who have assisted you, as you've named them, and thanked them yourself personally. Because this has not been an ordinary time to be Speaker. As I look around this very table now, with the perspex that is here and the masked members of this place, and uh, thankfully far more of them now back in this chamber that have been here for, for most of the last two years, you have had to navigate that and lead that. And I know how closely you worked with the President of the Senate through that and the Chief Health Officer of the ACT and uh, the Chief Medical Officer and ensured that this place continued to function as best as it possibly could while still respecting the very important principles of presence in this place. The parliament is a public place and should be a public place. What we say, how, on what side of the aisle we cross and where we sit and where we vote, there is a transparency in that which is inherent in the Westminster system. And you ensured that during this difficult period we retained all of that tradition and all of those principles while adapting to some very difficult circumstances. And I want to thank you on behalf of all members for achieving that. Mr Speaker, I want to wish you and Pam and, and the boys all the very best, but the time for that will come a little later because I'm looking forward to welcoming you back into the government party room tomorrow um, and to see you there sitting amongst us where you began. And I'm looking forward to you sharing your views on debates, as I know you're very keen to do, uh, particularly as we go um, forward into next year's election, and working closely um, with the party in terms of seeking to ensure that the seat you've so, ad so ably represented over all these years will continue to be um, represented by a Liberal member. And so I want to thank you for your dedication to party. I want you to thank you for your dedication to the parliament. Um, I want to thank you for your dedication to each and, and every member of this House for the way that you have engaged with us, uh, for the dedication and professionalism which you applied yourself to this task. And you have set a bar, a very, very high bar, I think, for those who will follow you. And uh, I know they will look to that standard and they'll be challenged by it, but I think they will equally be encouraged by it. And uh, that's what we should all do. Seek those high standards and ensure that we continue to work ably each and every day, we have the opportunity to achieve them. So well done on great service to our country. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. Well, this is a bittersweet moment because the, the respect and affection in which you are held on both sides of the House is as rare as it is earned and with good reason. Some decisions made in this place fall into what Gareth Evans once called the streaker's defence. In other words, it seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> Your election unopposed as Speaker, though, is a good idea that has looked even better over time, which is why you've achieved that honour 
three times. You have not so much redefined the role as restored it. As you put it that day, once you'd settled into that very high chair, I make that point because often people say parliament shouldn't be robust. It should, but it needn't be rude and it needn't be loud. And that is something I'd like to see improved. And then you said something that really encapsulated your approach. You said, I can't do that, but together we all can. A good speaker's a bit like a good ref. You don't want to watch them, you want to watch the play. And you have been an outstanding speaker. Like other leadership positions, the role of speaker is to bring parliament together rather than divide it. You followed a divisive speaker, that's the truth, which only made your determination to lift the standard of the parliament even more important. And unity is always better than division and whoever follows you will have a difficult task because of the quality of your performance. The job of speaker is a demanding one. The first speaker, Frederick Holder, actually died in the chamber, making an exit worthy of heart of darkness as he uttered his final words. Dreadful, dreadful. The Canberra Times called it Australia's shortest prominent political speech. <laughs> So there are worse ways to leave than the way that you are, Mr Speaker. <laughs> Your title may be Speaker, but you have been a careful listener. You have weighed up what is before you with great care and thought, with dry humour, with wisdom and, importantly, with authority. You are, in the best sense of the word, a parliamentarian. I believe that's an honourable title. Mm -hmm. Not everyone who elect is elected to this place does love the parliament. Your love for Australia is expressed by that love for this parliament. You understand how, at its best, it represents the aspirations of Australians. You've always sought to ensure that it turns those aspirations into reality as best it can. A parliament that debates, a parliament that legislates, a parliament that gets things done because that is our best way of bringing about positive, lasting change in this country. I've always thought, Mr Speaker, that a good speaker helps the government of the day because it's about order and about getting things done and that helps the government of the day. So it is an, a, 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 an irony, I think, <coughs> that partisanship actually hurts the government of the day. And I think in all of your decisions, Mr Speaker, uh, most of which I've agreed with 100 per cent, but all of which I have understood, there has never been any question whatsoever that you have uh, taken those decisions with integrity and without partisanship. And that is to your great credit, Mr Speaker, that you have done that, because it's a hard thing to do. You believe in the Westminster system that we inherited and made into something that is truly ours. We can't take for granted our democracy, our voting rights, our universal suffrage. Whole parts of the world do not enjoy what we enjoy in this country. The fact that we'll have an election like we have them and that determines the way forward and we have one vote, one value. It is precious. It must be strengthened and protected and a core part of that is respect. Not to treat it as an imposition on the people, but to cherish it as one of the greatest means we have of achieving our full potential as a nation. It's worth turning back to 13th of February 2002, to your first speech in Parliament. You said this, we will have differences about the best means to tackle the inevitable problems which all parliaments confront, but we should have no difference at all on the proposition that, in our short history, Australians have created a truly special nation that is the envy of the world. That's an important idea. While we have our differences, it is important to find our common points and to make more of them. There's so much that happens here more quietly. The cooperation, the shared desire to find a better way. And the way in which you were determined that in spite of a pandemic, this parliament would meet. And the fact that 
the respective leaders of the House and manager of opposition business cooperated with you to make sure that that, that was able to occur. <coughs> Not all the parliaments around the world met. Some of them shut down, uh, including here in Australia, for longer than is healthy in a democracy, in my view. You were determined to make sure that it happened. So that spirit isn't just contained within the walls of this building, but is spread throughout every electorate across our continent. Throughout it all, you've kept your feet on the ground as befits a Carlton supporter. <laughs> a few months after you became Speaker, you reminisced about what it was like being a humble MP at the other end of the boot. And I hope you don't have to uh, revisit this. As you put it, I hope Mum doesn't mind me saying this, but she used to get terribly upset when I got kicked out. She'd ring me up and tell me off. I only hope the phone calls got better after that. <laughs> you never wanted to be a conspicuous speaker, but your absence from the chair will be felt very keenly. I must say the only positive thing that I did think when you informed me of the decision that you were about to announce was that, oh well, we'll have a crack now in your seat. <laughs> because I'm sure that we would never have beaten you, Mr Speaker, mm -hmm. in that electorate because of the regard that you have, uh, you have held. And can I thank you as well, Mr Speaker, for visiting my electorate, uh, Birchgrove Public School, to talk to the students there with me in a friendly way so that those students will walk away from that day uh, thinking, well, hey, people from different sides of the fence can get on. <coughs> and can talk about our democracy and our processes. And you were very welcome, and you will always be welcome in my electorate, or indeed in my home, Mr Speaker, as a friend. Whoever follows you will have considerable shoes to fill. They'll feel the expectation the Australian people have to uphold the standing orders to act in the interests of the whole parliament and all it represents, just as you have done. So on behalf of all of us on this side of the House, thank you. Thank you. The Deputy Prime Minister. Well, um, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I, I genuinely mean that. And as you have stated, this is not a requiem, but a return to the seat of Casey, and that in itself is a statement of your character that you would spend the remainder of your political career going back to serve the people who gave you that incredible <coughs> honour to represent you to represent them here. Um, Mr Speaker, uh, one of the advice I always give to people when they come here is that you play rugby in the chamber and you play rugby on the 7.30 report, but you don't play rugby in the corridor, um, where everybody, once they leave here, should work in some form of collegiate way, otherwise this place um, really would be a nasty place to, to live and work. Um, nonetheless, you have to manage the rugby in the chamber, and it is, it is an adversarial chamber by its very nature. We have to walk that fine line between being boorish and boring. Um, one is uh, you don't want to listen to, and the other one you can't be bothered listening to. And uh, no doubt, 94A, you've uh, certainly worn out the manual there, but there are other interesting standing orders which we've tested you with, 14A being one of them. Uh, and that in itself, your capacity and your, your acute mind and your, adro your adroit and uh, insightful process of actually <coughs> looking over. Uh, the standing orders understand and understanding them, being across them and giving a, you know, a articulate reference to them has given you uh, the capacity to be held in great stead throughout this building because people respect um, your decisions. Uh, and in, with, within that uh, understanding the standing orders also becomes that discerning capacity to hear the calls of the wild and to understand who is making the interjection without having to uh, necessarily see them do it. And we've all had occasion that you've managed to call us out, even with the masks on, which gave us some form of protection, but nonetheless, <laughs> you can still find us. Uh, and so by doing, you uh, return the place from being a crazy jungle back to being a more genteel wood. And uh, I think people, because by reason of their respect for you, have respected uh, your, your rulings and respected your orders and that has held our, our parliament in a better light. You set a standard, and you set a standard that you are now offering as, uh, uh, as, a, as a legacy for who you are and uh, also an adornment of hopefully what comes after you, Mr Speaker. 
no doubt people will be referring back to you and um, using your, your time as a juxtaposition to their efforts. Uh, and no doubt that will be a very, a very ha a high bar to jump. This parliament, Mr Speaker, is watched by so many. And uh, I once made the fatal mistake here uh, one, one, I think, uh, evening of saying, if anybody's watching this, please, ri please ring my office. And they did. Um, in fact, the phone just about rang off the hook. What that means, of course, is that our actions in here uh, are relayed far and wide. Uh, our nation is defined by many things, and it is defined by the actions within this parliament. Therefore, it's so vitally important in being defined by the actions of this parliament that the actions of this parliament reflects Australia, reflects its colour, uh, reflects the, the capacity for the, the great debaters and the great uh, peop people who are powerful in the art of rhetoric, whether it's gone from, from Keating to Costello. Uh, that is part of the colour of parliament, and it's something also that, that a speaker has to find that line between so that um, people find the, the, the process something more palatable and something they can get through. So, um, so Mr Speaker, how we have been seen here um, has been presided over by you. And I believe in your time in the seat, you have shown to Australia a better side of all our nation. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Speaker. Tony, as you observe, we've known each other for 35 years, which is a pretty confronting number. Which I would like to assert is because we went to preschool together, but uh, sadly that would be misleading the House. When I first arrived uh, at Melbourne University on the first day of O Week in 1986, I was naive, tended to see things in black and white, good and bad, perhaps hadn't yet seen the whole world in its full colour. But at least it provided me, in terms of my sense of the world of politics, with a set of simple, comforting truths. And so for those of us who were lined up at the Labor Club desk, well, we were obviously believing in fairness, compassion, justice. We were selfless and virtuous. And those who were lining up at the Liberal Club desk, well, they were obviously in it for themselves. They were obviously only about the money. They were completely selfish. And then I met Tony Smith, who was a confusing proposition. I mean, to start with, I remember saying to Tony, mate, you are a Liberal, you're driving a red Monaro and you've got a mullet. What the hell? <laughs> But I did actually remember speaking to some friends afterwards and saying, I think I just met a nice liberal. And they said, are you sure, a nice liberal? I mean, how would that even work, a nice <laughs> liberal? Because from the very outset, the concept of Tony Smith has been challenging me throughout my political life. <laughs> to be clear, virtue does live on this side of the house. <laughs> but if he can be a good bloke, well, then maybe there are some others of you over there who are actually decent people. As it turns out, as it turns out Tony and I have a lot in common. We were born four months apart. Our fathers taught at the schools that we both attended. Tony's dad was a chemistry teacher. My dad was a maths teacher. We were both the youngest in our families with older sisters who both thought we were spoiled. We both attended Melbourne University starting in exactly the same year, and we even passionately support footy teams which share the same colours. So maybe that does explain why his politics is a bit more benign than the rest of you lot. <laughs> but Tony is no stranger to the partisan contest, and that's important because in a democratic two-party system, it matters that the parties compete. And over the last 20 years, that's exactly what Tony has done in a seat which the Liberals cannot take for granted but which Tony Smith has made his own. Tony sat on John Howard's front bench. He was uh, a shadow minister during the Rudd and Gillard years, so he knows all about the partisan contest and how it is practised. But in a larger sense, as we engage in our partisan activities, we do so in the service of a greater democracy which is embodied by this parliament. And by the idea of being 
an Australian parliamentarian in the service of the whole nation. And I think that idea, in my humble opinion, comes closest to capturing the spirit of Tony Smith, which is why, when in 2015 Tony became Mr Speaker, it was, as, it was as if he were made for the job. Mr Speaker's intelligence had him across the standing orders and the procedures in no time. But much more importantly than that, Speaker, your integrity, your honour, the fundamental decency that characterises who you are meant that almost immediately you had the confidence of this entire House in a way that I've never seen before. And when I think about you and I sitting back there at the Melbourne Uni SRC back in 1988, and when I look at you sitting there right now, I feel so proud of you because you have risen truly to be a giant. And the fact that on three separate occasions you have been elected unopposed to the speakership of this House is just one sign of why you stand apart in modern times as perhaps being the greatest speaker of them all. And so, Mr Speaker, in this role, we will miss you very much. Good luck in the future. I know that you have a few more months as the member for Casey, but farewell, my friend. You leave this seat with the rarest of achievements because you genuinely go with the heartfelt goodwill and best wishes of every single member of this place. The Leader of the House. Well, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. It's a great honour to follow uh, in footsteps of uh, the previous speakers. Uh, some fine words have been spoken about you, Mr Speaker, and rightly so. Uh, many of us have known you for a long period of time, and it will come as no surprise to anyone in this chamber that uh, the Speaker has gone around individually to us, given specific writing instructions about the <laughs> length of these speeches, the composition. Uh, don't overdo it and uh, don't speak for too long. Uh, he's been uh, very uh, dedicated uh, to this place uh, right to his last moment in that chair. Uh, Mr Speaker, you and I came into the parliament uh, in 2001, 20 years ago, and I can give uh, somewhat of a rare insight to follow on uh, from the member for Cryo's sort of personal reflection on his uh, time having known the Speaker. And as flatmates, uh, Mr Speaker, you, Stephen Chobo and I started out uh, in this place and I can say for the benefit of those members here uh, that um, you know, there were two rowdy people in that household and you were not one of them, Mr Speaker. <laughs> Stephen Chobo and I and others, as I look across so that I can implicate uh, some across on the other side as well, we used to on occasion go to the Holy Grail on a Wednesday night. Uh, there are some people smiling, some looking down, uh, but <laughs> on our return back to the unit, uh, you weren't flustered, uh, we didn't disturb you, mm -hmm. and it did not make you miss a beat on your regimented scheme and life. Uh, you, you had parted our unit uh, at the same time every morning to come up uh, to the House to embark on your exercise program and uh, apply yourself in a disciplined way uh, to this vocation. And that, uh, Mr Speaker, I think uh, demonstrates your uh, great capacity, and I think there is an enormous amount uh, to be said of your sense of history and intellect that's been referred to before, your sense of political history, uh, in particular uh, American political history, and uh, the sense of belief and the sense of an adherence to uh, beliefs and a structure uh, that is rarely seen uh, in public life. And I think there is uh, uh, Mr Speaker, a lot that's been said today uh, that reflects on this being a one in 100 year event. Uh, we talk about uh, those events, but this is a one in 100 year event. Uh, the way in which you have been selected by this parliament, uh, been honoured by this parliament, uh, is a reflection on your own character. And I want to make mention very quickly of your friendship with Peter Costello. And I know that uh, that has been uh, a significant influence on your time in this place, and that friendship endures to this day. Uh, he is a dear friend and mentor of yours, 
and you've honoured that relationship and I know that he values that very much also. And he has uh, a lot to be proud of as well. Uh, I worked with Peter Costello, as many of us did, uh, over a long period of time. He doesn't suffer fools. And he insisted on a staff body of people of the highest calibre. Uh, those with a great intellect, those with a great political capacity and the capacity and capability uh, that he desired, you delivered. And there are many others uh, in that office that have gone on to great things as well. But he was well served by you, Mr Speaker, and in turn uh, we have uh, uh, by your service here um, a lot to owe you and a lot to owe him uh, and your staff. I also want to pay tribute to, uh, to your staff with whom uh, Tony Burke and I work very closely and uh, pay respect to them because they have provided you with support uh, on this journey as well. Uh, it's not an easy job. Many people have made reference to, to that. Uh, and without good staff, none of us can perform within our individual roles. Uh, the most uh, compelling element to your service uh, has been the way in which you have honoured our Westminster system. And there's a lot that's been written and a lot that's been said in Australian public life about politicians and how we're regarded by the public. I believe that this is an incredibly noble profession. And we have sometimes not put our best foot forward or we don't uh, display the best qualities of this place during question time, but we live in one of the greatest countries in the world. And you have approached your job in a way that has lifted the standard in this house and has reflected favourably upon us uh, and our generation uh, with the Australian people. And I think that is a great credit to you and the values uh, and, as I say, your sense of history and character that you've brought to this job. I wish you very well in your remaining hours in this role and I wish you well uh, in your continuing months as the member for Casey. You've been a fine local member and there will be a lot more said about that uh, in due course. But thank you for the way in which you've approached your office, the way in which you've engaged with us uh, and the service that, uh, uh, that you've undertaken in your country's name. Thank you. The Manager of Opposition Business. Thanks very much, Mr Speaker. Uh, I know you don't want this moment terribly, and a few people have reflected on that, uh, but this parliament's not really good at moments of grace, and we're getting one now, uh, and it's only because of you. Uh, and that needs to be noted that from the moment you took that chair, that chair is seated above the rest of us, but you've never looked down on the parliament that you've presided over. Uh, there are many people here who uh, pay attention in different ways to the parliament. There are a few people who really value parliamentary debate and the parliament itself. And whenever some people have tried to stifle parliamentary debate or wreck it in different ways, you have been a handbrake on that uh, and a handbrake on making sure that this place as close to possible and within your power was able to function as a parliament. Uh, Speaker Holder elected three times unopposed. And the other reference, the other record that hasn't been referred to, but is yours as well, nominated by the government, a government backbencher, <coughs> seconded by an opposition backbencher. Uh, it's only happened twice, happened with Speaker Holder, has happened with yourself. Uh, and it's because you have been a speaker who has not belonged to one side of the politics when you're in the chair, you've belonged to the House. And that's been appreciated and acknowledged. It doesn't mean that everybody has liked every decision that you've made. You have used 94A on 730 occasions. <laughs> 37 government, 693 yeah, time, opposition. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and Graham Perrett on 49. If you'd punted him today, he would have made his 50. Uh, I, I will say you haven't been afraid to throw out ministers, though. The Minister for Communications twice. Uh, the Minister for Government Services and Assistant Treasurer uh, each kicked out once. Uh, former Minister Michael Keenan kicked out and then eventually decided to not come back. We, uh, you punted me once, uh, and you were right to. Uh, it was after I took a point of order on the Deputy Prime Minister, not for the purposes of raising anything procedurally, but because I thought he needed to take a breath. And it was, it was fair to kick me out for that. There's been a, there's been a, a series of changes during COVID where, being no doubt, had someone else been in the chair, we might not have been able to bring the sides together. Had someone else been in the chair, the parliament might not have been able to sit. Uh, and 
that is a fundamental change for what democracy would have been over the last two years. But at different points where one party or the other was being difficult, you did bring us together, and as a result, the democracy has been the better for it. Uh, I do want to acknowledge just a couple of other moments. Uh, first of all, when the Medivac legislation came before the House, you were put in a very difficult position. You were given legal advice and decided to table it, not at the moment the debate occurred, but at the beginning of the MPI, and then to allow the House to make its decisions as to how it would handle that. Now, I know you didn't do that for the purposes of the legislation. It did make a fundamental difference to people's lives that you did that. But the purpose for which you did it was the purpose that the Speaker is meant to be accountable for. You did it to allow the House to make its own decision, and it did. Similarly, you're in the chair for three glorious hours on the 1st of September 2016 uh, during, during a, a magnificent moment of democracy where we debated whether or not there should be a Banking Royal Commission when the opposition uh, temporarily had the numbers on the floor. Uh, a moment we cherish and reflect back on as often as we can. Uh, and similarly, when uh, the surprise happened and the moment uh, Mr Lou O'Brien left the room, I nominated him, uh, put you in a situation of setting some new precedents, and you did so fairly. Uh, we're terribly grateful to your staff. We've relied on your staff and worked uh, with your, your staff closely over the years. No, very few members would be aware as to how many decisions are made about members' welfare and protecting people in different ways and protecting staff in different ways, and your office have been a huge part of that. Uh, the last time I can remember someone uh, voluntarily choosing to leave six months prior to the end of a term uh, was Bob Hol Holverson uh, when, when that happened, and uh, the, the position for the remaining six months went to the National Party as a reflection on the, of a coalition government of the importance of the National Party on that occasion. Um, we'll see what happens tomorrow. But I will, I will say, uh, Mr Speaker, the respect that you have around the House is rare. It is earned. And if on your way to Government House tomorrow uh, you discover that the com cars can't get through and there is a blockade, it will be 150 of us. And just finally, the uh, member for Melbourne on behalf of the crossbench. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Speaker. Um, a lot has been said about your fairness in applying rulings. And can I say, as a member of the crossbench, I certainly felt at every stage that applied to us as well, applied to me. Um, the, yeah, I hope you'll take this in the spirit in which it's intended, but I felt that when you did me over, I always understood why. And um, if I didn't, you'd explain it to me. And there certainly has been a strong sense, speaking on uh, my own behalf, that we could rely on you acting predictably and following the rules. And in the context where there is a growing crossbench and where we've had tied votes and votes that have gone against the way that uh, governments have wanted, and that might happen more often from time to time, being able to rely on that was critical. And um, I think probably, perhaps if I can say in the speeches, perhaps not enough has been made of your wit and it has certainly made time go faster here on those days that it has dragged. I've seen some speakers before, and we've had some speakers that were funny. I'm not sure they were trying to be, but I think you have always um, managed to make the debate more robust through your humour and through your wit, and just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, one other matter that has certainly made a difference to me as a local member has been your commitment to um, education and parliamentary education, especially among schools. And the, I know that a couple of schools in my electorate have benefited greatly from your intervention and your officer's willingness to come and help and um, support them while they were up here or to get them up here. And if you've done that for me, I suspect you've done that for many others across the chamber as well. And I think there are a lot of people across this country who are very, very grateful for, your, for you um, extending your support on that. And lastly, if I could ask a final question of you, Mr Speaker, if I could ask you to convey to your staff, certainly on behalf of me and I expect on behalf of many members of the crossbench as well, um, their willingness and openness to engage with us, especially in the context, as I said, where parliaments are used to operating in a certain way and with a growing crossbench, I know that throws up questions that, uh, that speakers in particular and others have to deal with. Uh, they've always been open and willing to engage and they've allowed us to have access to you and that has, I think, made this place operate far, more, far better and far more democratically. And so if I could ask you to convey to your staff um, uh, our sincere thanks for all their work over the years.
Thank you, and thank you for the Prime Minister, Leader of the Opposition, and all other speakers. It's very humbling. I'll be in the chair for the adjournment debate uh, tonight, and uh, as I said, we'll uh, go to Yarralumla first thing in the morning. And I'll see you back here at 12 noon tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>